Writing clean code is a skill and you need to practice to get better. So I prepared a clean coding exercise for you. We are going to look at some code and see how we can refactor it to make it follow clean coding principles. What I have here is the order processor, which has a single process method accepting an order instance. And then it applies a bunch of checks to the order before finally flagging the order as processed. This code violates a number of clean coding principles, so we're going to fix them one by one and discuss why the refactored code is better. The first thing I'm going to tackle is all of the nesting that we have inside of this method. So we have one level here, level two, level three, level four. So four levels of nesting. This increases the complexity of your method because it makes it harder to read. And we're going to start by applying the early return principle. So what this principle states is as soon as you have some sort of condition that is broken, you can safely return from this method. So if we were to start applying the early return principle, our method would look like this. So instead of having a nested order check, we're going to say if the order is null, then just return from this method. And we can take all of this code here, which was nested in this first check and move it outside. The next condition checks if the order is verified. So we're going to negate it. And if the order is not verified, then we're going to return from this method. Again, we can take this nested code here and replace it with what we have left. And the last thing that we can do is also take this part here and again negate it. So let's say if order items count as equal to zero, meaning we have no items on the order, then we can just return from this method and let's get rid of this final level of nesting and we are left with this. So now instead of the deeply nested structure, we have a bunch of preconditions that check if the order is in a proper state. And if it is not, we just return from the process method and we don't process the order. Let's still focus on this part here. So what we essentially have are guard clauses in our process method. And we can take this a step further by merging them all into one condition. So this can be if the order is null or if the order is not verified or if the number of items on the order is equal to zero. So if order items count is equal to zero, then we want to return. So we essentially merge the first three conditions into a single if statement. Now we can remove these two guard clauses and we are left with this. Now the problem is this isn't particularly readable. So what can we do about it? What we can do to slightly improve readability is replace this check here, which checks if there are not any items with the appropriate call to the link any method. So we can say if order items not any, then we also want to return. What we can do to make this better is move this check into either a variable or a method with a descriptive name. I prefer to use methods because I find them more readable. So we can use the extract method refactoring and let's say is order processable. So when is the order processable? If the order is not null and the order is verified and we have items on the order. Working with negative conditions is pretty difficult. So this is why I negated all of the expressions here. And here I can say if the order is not processable, then my guard clause fails and I can return from the process method. One thing that's slightly annoying is now the process method doesn't have context that the order is no longer null after this check. So you could add the null forgetting operator and then you're going to lose the compiler warning. Now let's talk about exceptions. So right here we have two conditions 
checking some business logic, and if the condition isn't met, we are throwing a generic exception. If you decide to use exceptions as part of your business logic, you should always prefer to use specific exceptions. So instead of throwing an exception like this, we can try to figure out what is the condition that we are checking before throwing the exception. So if the order has too many items, then we want to throw a specific exception. So let's create such an exception. I'm going to add a new class and let's call it too many line items exception. So we're going to make this public and sealed and I want to inherit the base exception class. We're going to copy the exception message that I had in the order processor and pass it to the exception base class constructor. So let's create our constructor and in the base constructor we're going to pass the exception message and we want to take in the order ID. So let's say this is the order ID as the argument of our constructor and now we can pass it to the base exception message. Another thing that's going to improve the readability of your code is preferring string interpolation over concatenation. So instead of having something like this, you can convert it to an interpolated string, which is going to be more readable. And the benefit of having specific exceptions is that you can include contextual information as properties on your exception. So let's say you want to expose the order ID so that whoever is catching this exception can know what is the ID of the order that has too many line items. If we go back to the order processor, we can replace this with a too many line items exception and just pass in the order ID. Let's do the same thing for the second exception that we have here, where we check the order status and if it's not ready to process, then we throw some sort of order isn't ready to process exception. So let's go to the exception that I already have and use some copy paste magic to come up with the order not ready for processing exception. So I'm going to update the constructor and I want to use the exception message that I have here as part of the order not ready for processing exception. And as I said, I'm going to be using string interpolation instead of concatenation. And I can now move this into its own class. I'm going to head back to my order processor and we're going to throw a new order not ready for processing exception and pass it the order ID. And for readability, let's actually rename this to order has too many line items exception so that we are consistent with the naming convention that we are using in the second exception. The process method is starting to look better with the guard clause that we have here and the specific exceptions that we are using. Now let's tackle these conditions here which are using some magic values. So in this case we have a magic number which is 15 in this case and we don't really know what it's representing. And the same here with a magic string representing an order status, strings and integers don't really convey much meaning. I'm going to make this code cleaner in two different ways. So for the magic number, we are just going to introduce a constant at the order processor level. So let's say we have a private constant integer and we have to come up with a descriptive name. Let's call it processable number of line items and we're going to give it the value of 15. So now we can replace this magic number here with a constant that has a descriptive name and now this suddenly starts making a lot more sense. So if the order has more items than the processable number of line items, we throw an exception. So now you can see how this starts making a lot more sense and that there's some business concern that we are taking care of. For the magic string that we are using to represent the order status, I'm going to use something else. So whenever you have a status column, which can have a few fixed values, a really good solution can be using enums. So let's create an order status enum, and we're going to use it instead of a string. 
So let's say that the default status is pending. And let's say we also have a ready to process status with a value of one. So I'm going to move the enum into its own file and we're going to update our order class to replace the status with the order status enum and we're going to give it a default value of pending. Now if I go back to my order processor, I can do something like this. I can say if the order status is not equal to ready to process, then we throw an exception. So you can see how using enums can make your code much more readable. It's also refactor proof. So let's take a look at the entire order processor class. So we started with adding a guard clause, adding specific exceptions, and then we fixed the use of magic numbers and magic strings by replacing them with constants and enums. One more thing that could be an issue here is that you have different behavior for the guard clause here and the checks here, which are also a sort of guard clause, but are throwing exceptions. It would be ideal if they were either all throwing exceptions or that none of them were. But if they don't throw exceptions, you're losing contextual information on what was actually the problem. So what you can do is replace the return type of void with a result object. So let's say we add another class, which we are going to call process order result. Let's convert it into a record, and I'm only going to give it two properties. So one is going to be the order ID. We're going to give it a get and an init setter. Then we're going to have a string property for our message. And again, a get and init setter and let's create a private constructor which is going to create the process order result and it's going to accept the order id and the message parameters now let's just assign these to our properties what we're going to do is expose methods that are going to create a process order result instance and these are going to match the conditions that we have in these checks here so let's say we have a public static method returning a process order result instance and let's give it a name of not processable and we're going to accept an order ID and we're going to call our constructor, pass it the order ID and whatever is the message that we want to have for this process order result. Let's for example say the order with this order ID is not processable. And let me just adjust this so like so. And let's create the other two results. And the only thing that's going to change is the name of this method and the message that we are passing. So we have an not ready for processing process order result. And we have an has too many line items process order result. So I'm going to copy the message from the exceptions that we created earlier. So this is the has too many line items and this is the one for the order isn't ready to process. So let me just update this here. And now if we head back to our order processor, we're going to be returning this process order result. So let's replace this here. And now this becomes process order result, not processable, and we pass it the order ID. I actually forgot that this could be nullable, so let's just update this to not have an order ID argument. We're going to pass it the default value here, and we're just going to say the order is not processable. If I head back to the order processor, I can just return the process order result, not processable. Now I'm just returning a not processable process order result. We're going to then replace this exception here with a has too many line items and we're going to pass it the order ID and we're going to replace this exception here with a new process order result of not ready for processing and we're going to give it the order ID. Now what happens if all of these actually pass, we manage to process the order 
then we need to return some sort of success result. So let's go back to the process order result. We'll create a new method that is going to return a new process order result. We're going to give it a name of successful and we can also expose the order ID and some success message. So let's say we create a new process order result, give it the order ID and let's say the order with this ID was successfully processed. And now if I head back to the order processor, I can say return process order result successful for this order ID. So this is what the order processor ends up looking like in the end. We started with a deeply nested structure that was breaking a lot of clean coding principles and we ended up with this which I consider to be a lot more readable. If you liked this refactoring video, take a look at this video next where I'm refactoring from an anemic domain model to a rich domain model by applying domain-driven design principles. Thanks for watching and until next time, stay awesome.